I've been trying to learn Blender for about three years now. That is to say, opening the program once every six months, attempting the donut tutorial, and realizing my puny 2D animation brain is not cut out for this 3D stuff. But I think the problem is, I was biting off more donut than I can chew. Maybe instead of jumping straight into 3D, it would be an easier transition to learn the basics of Blender's 2D application, Grease Pencil. You can do a lot of things in Grease Pencil, like incorporating complex camera movements, or combining 2D and 3D elements. But the main thing I decided to learn first was how to do simple line animation. So here's the basic tools you need to know how to do this. First thing is opening a new project file. We'll select 2D animation on startup. In the viewport, there's tons of things to click on and it's quite overwhelming and not super intuitive. Here's what I found to be the bare essentials for jumping right into animating. We can zoom in and out of our canvas with the magnifier glass to the right of the screen. And we can use the hand to reposition our view. You can also zoom in and out using the scroll wheel on your mouse. If your camera view gets all crazy like this, push zero on your number pad and you'll be right back to the canvas view. Let's try making some marks on screen. On the left, we can see that we're in draw mode. Under draw mode, there's a pencil icon. Click on this and you'll be able to select different brush types. We can tweak the brush parameters to our liking. We adjust the radius here, which is the brush size. The strength affects the pressure sensitivity of the brush. I usually keep the strength all the way up for clean line work so that there's no changes in opacity. But reducing the strength for rough animation, background art, texturing, and shading can help get natural gradations in tone. On this icon that says solid stroke, we can change what kinds of strokes the brush does, like square strokes, which could be used for texturing, or solid fill, which completely colors in whatever shape you draw. You can also pick these from the materials section. We can change the colors of our brush by going to the toolbar, go to color, and click color attributes. Here we can pick any color we'd like our line art to be. On this squiggly green icon called data, we'll find our layers. This works just like any other art program where you have layers stacked on layers, and whatever layer is on top will show first. For example, the line art layer would be on top and the layer for filling in the flat colors would go below. After you've drawn your line art, you can color it in using the paint bucket tool. Select the paint bucket from the toolbar. Go to the squiggly green line on the data section and select your fills layer. Click on the materials tab. Select the material for solid fill. Now when you click inside the line work, the entire section should be filled in as long as you don't have gaps in the line work. To do things like scaling or resizing the drawing, we have to go to object mode. In object mode, click your drawing. Now with your drawing selected, click S for scale to resize. The cool thing about these vector drawings is that no matter how large you scale the image, the line quality is never reduced or blurry. If you just want to scale something horizontally, click S, then X. To scale something only vertically, click S, then Z. To rotate, select your object and press R. To move the drawing around, select your object and press G for grab. To add new layers that you can manipulate individually, go to Add in Object Mode and select Grease Pencil. You can also press Shift A for Add. By adding new Grease Pencil objects, you can keep multiple layers separated if you want to add camera movement or parallax scrolling to individual elements. You can select the desired layer in Object Mode and move it around. Use the transform tool on the keyframes and the object will move to these locations when you hit play. Press N to bring up transform options. Press G to grab your object and move it where you want or enter the numbers in the transform box. Press I to create a keyframe of this location on the frame you're on in the timeline. Now the object will move from one keyframe to the next. You can adjust how long or fast the motion happens by moving the keyframes closer or further apart on the timeline. We can click tab to go back to drawing mode. We've successfully made lines appear on the screen, which is pretty cool. But how do we animate? Down here we have the timeline. This is where animation frames will be shown in sequential order from left to right, as well as layers shown from top to bottom on the left hand side. To the right of your animation player bar, you have your start and end frames. You can adjust this to any number to play these frames. 
This will be helpful if you only want to see a small section playing as a loop. And when you export, Blender will only export from the start and ending frames you enter. Select this little circle to turn on auto keying. The auto key ensures that each time we draw a new frame, the canvas will be blank. If auto keying is turned off, then the new frame will retain whatever we drew on the previous frame. Use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move to the next or previous frame, and press the spacebar to play. Over on the data section, we have a part that shows onion skinning. You can adjust the opacity of the frames here for in-betweening. You can also increase or decrease the number of frames you see on screen. And you can change the colors you'd like the before and after frames to be in. This little wrench is the modifier section. Modifiers can be used to alter how your art looks and behaves. I'm interested in the noise modifier, which can create an animated line boil effect. In TV Paint, I would have to animate 3 to 5 frames to get a line boil effect. But with the noise modifier, you can get a line boil automatically. The noise modifier can be really wonky and intense. You can adjust the intensity with the position. I find that a position setting somewhere between 0.10 and 0.15 looks pretty nice. The thickness changes the variation of line width, and the noise scale changes how wiggly the lines look. You'll notice that the effect is applied to all layers. If you want to apply the modifier to only one layer, Go down to the Influence tab inside the modifier. Inside the Influence tab, you can apply the modifier to only one layer or material. Now that we have a grasp of the basic tools, it's time to animate something. The true test of learning is applying knowledge to a project. I wanted to do something pretty streamlined and simple, something that wouldn't be too cognitively demanding or require too much creative thinking, since the main goal right now is building familiarity with the program. What I decided to do was a rotoscoping exercise. The photographs of sequential movement by Moy Bridge are still an excellent resource for animators to study. So I picked 22 animals to rotoscope from the book Animals in Motion. Rotoscoping is also a great technique for beginner animators to learn from. There's a difference between uncritical tracing and rotoscoping thoughtfully with intention. You have to be an editor while rotoscoping choosing which aspects to draw and which to ignore. You're training your editor's eye when rotoscoping. Don't try to trace every single wiggle, angle, and shape you see. Doing this will cause your animation to look jittery and floaty. It's better to simplify shapes and draw with more confident lines. See the main shape and draw that. No need to be slow and meticulously draw everything. But emphasizing some details is good too. Having lines and shapes that range from big, medium, and small adds variation to the design. Rotoscoping a new subject can also deepen your understanding of the subject if you choose to animate it later. I learned a lot about some animals by drawing several frames of them. After a few frames of rotoscoping this cow, I started to wonder why the cow only had one udder. And then I realized this cow was in fact a male. And that's when I realized I am, in fact, an idiot. Now that the line work's done, it's time for coloring. I'm using a light blue for the flat colors to keep the color scheme simple and analogous with the dark blue line work. I found the paint bucket tool very finicky and frustrating to use in Blender, so I decided to export the line art as PNG sequences with alpha layers and import these frames into TV Paint, where I could easily color them. Even though I had to use a bit of an outside program to finish the animation, I still consider this Blender experiment a success as I learned the basic controls and drawing workflow of Blender Grease Pencil. I hope this situationship with Blender will blossom into a full, working animation relationship. I'll be posting more tutorials on new things I'm learning, so be sure to subscribe and like the video if you want to see more. Oof. I just realized I did not show how to import images or reference video to Blender for rotoscoping. So this is a bonus section of the video showing how to do that. If you want to import reference images or video into Blender Grease Pencil, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you have the import images add-on installed. So all you need to do is go up to edit and go into preferences and then under add-ons type in import image and you'll have it right here so just make sure that this is selected next you need to go up to here where it says draw mode and select object mode and then go over to add and then scroll down to image 
and you'll have images as planes. And then from here, you can go into whatever folder has your video or images that you wanna import. And so you just select it, click import image as planes, and now it is successfully into your project file. Now see, over here you'll see that my resolution is 4K, so I just need to click S and scale this up. And then I can easily scale this up to the correct size. And now when I play it, the file plays. Now if I'm playing this as a loop, you'll see that it's stopping because I actually have more frames down on my timeline than I have frames in the video. So I'll find the ending frame is 11, so I'll just go over to my end frame and click 11, and now it'll play the correct amount of frames seamlessly. The other thing you'll wanna do is make sure that your frame rate is matching your source file. So this source file is 15 frames a second. So I went over here under the output tab and I made it 15 frames a second. And then of course you can adjust the resolution. And then when you go into output, you have your folder that you will output it as, and you can choose your color depth, uh, whether it has transparent backgrounds. An important note is the viewport shading. If you're up here in solid mode, you won't see your reference footage. So you wanna go over to the right and click on this one, the rendered shading, and now you'll see the reference footage in the background. Also, go over to your footage under where you imported it and you'll obviously have to make sure that the eyeball is turned on or else you won't see it either. So this is just a very simple way to get your images into a blender that you can rotoscope trace or just use as reference thank you so much for watching this far like the video if you liked it be sure to check out the other vids on the channel i have animation stuff on animeloop.com and here's a special patreon shout out to these top supporters jerry mcclellan of supergalacticfantastic.com clyde o'clock dean red and this person whose name i do not know how to read or say but I greatly appreciate your support. The next thing I think you should do is click the video on the end screen. Well, I'm gonna go back to the drawing board and I hope you have a creative day.